Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedekase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is very, very special. I have with me Dr. Luciano Floridi. We're going to be talking about uh, information, which is really fun. The philosophy of information. He is a pioneer. I think he's invented the philosophy of information in a sense. In a sense, it's always been here the whole time. That's one of his arguments as well. It's really cool. Uh, you guys can check out his his short little book, Information, a very short introduction. He's got a lot of other books, but uh, this is a great intro to it. I've been blessed by it as well. Today, we're going to be talking about information, maybe some AI, but just what what is information? That's going to be a really fun one. And before we jump in, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen over on Patreon. If you guys like the show, support it on Patreon or YouTube members. This one, this episode is also support, uh, brought to you by Saddleback Leather. You guys know I love Saddleback Leather stuff. Look uh, in the description for the link to Saddleback. I have it all over my office. It's amazing stuff. I love it. Check them out. And if you use my link, then uh, you'll support the podcast. So please do that. No, not too much commodification today because I want to jump in with Dr. Floridi. So let's just pull him right in. Dr. Floridi, thanks, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, before we get in, so I already, I pronounce the podcast incorrectly and I do that intentionally because I'm an American swine and I, I think it'd be a little pretentious if I just jumped in from my Chicago accent to Ponce, but also my, my last name is Italian. My grandfather, or uh, my grandfather was Sicilian, but my dad was adopted by him. He's Italian. You're, you're Italian. Can you pronounce my last name for me? Did you, can you, can you help us with this? So, Frankie, I, I need to find your surname first of all. But yeah, uh, it's uh, right down in right down in the picture. It, it's should... right that there it is. Uh, set the case. There mean, we go. It means seven houses. Yeah, that's right. Set the. Uh, can can you do it one more time for me? <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, that's why the invitation. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, set the case. Oh, it's beautiful. That's so good. Thank you. Um, well, Doctor Floridi, you you were you spent like half of your academic life as, as a logic guy, mathematical logic. And I, I just realized, um, I was listening to one of your interviews and you said you, or maybe I was looking up your, re your info about you and you studied with Susan Hack. Is that right? I did. Yes. So, so her book cool. philosophy of logic is like epic. So wonderful. It oh, life changing for me a while back when I was in seminary, beautiful, amazing. You, you got in through logic and somehow you became the, the information guy. Can you, can you help us with that? How, how'd that happen? Yeah, so, um, well, that book uh, was, um, uh, at the time, uh, was translated into Italian. Uh, at the time, I didn't have any English. That was, that was embarrassing. So I was uh, a first-year student, undergraduate, and uh, my English was like, you know, I could hardly hold it uh, So I read that um, accidentally. It was not part of any course, but, you know, the, the usual curious, uh, investigative uh, undergrad who wants to know more about this and that just came out. Um, and, uh, it, it just made a revolution in my way of thinking. Um, uh, there were two books. One actually was a set book for a course on introduction to ethics, which was, uh, ethics by E.G. Moore. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I discovered this world of analytic philosophy where you could actually talk about problems, mm -hmm. not about people. Well, that is not entirely true because then analytic philosophy became mostly about Russell, Wittgenstein, and Frege. Uh, but it's the destiny of any you know, uh, philosophical trend. Uh, you start with the philosophy of problems and then you end with philosophers' problems. But at the time, we, shall we say, uh, the community of uh, early stage career, little guy, me, uh, and other big, big names, we were still dealing with philosophical problems. And uh, both from the ethics side, you know, uh, E.G. Moore, and uh, from the logic and philosophical logic, uh, Susan, uh, uh, it, it was fascinating how you could have remarkable, clear and precise tools mm -hmm. to tackle issues that you thought were interesting, important. Um, so that was the beginning. Uh, I wrote a letter with a stamp, uh, to Susan, uh, who was a warrior and I started a little conversation with her. Then I got a a scholarship from Rome University to go and work with her and Michael Dammett, oh, yeah. uh, at work in, in, uh, in Oxford. And what was uh, a six months, uh, write your, uh, undergraduate thesis, uh, abroad kind of, uh, <laughs> project 
what finds me now at Yale. So no, I never left basically. Wow. Um, but it was uh, fascinating. But you asked actually, sorry, um, the question, how did I move from there to... America? Yeah. Well, the thing, it, we need to introduce a third character uh, who is not just uh, E.G. Moore and uh, Susan Hack, but uh, Popper, uh, Carl Popper. Yeah. I got lucky uh, again. Uh, Popper was still alive. Uh, I was retired. Uh, I was writing some philosophical stuff on his work. And, and I, again, as a graduate student would, I wrote the usual letter with a stamp and said, Dear Sir Carl, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, he actually replied. So we had this very quick conversation. Uh, I cherished the, 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 that letter. I must have that particular letter, in which he disagreed completely with me, but that's another <laughs> story. <of this. laughs> but you know, you're, not, you're a graduate student and there is no Carl Popper disagreeing with you. Like, you think you are really you know, part of the club, blah, blah, blah. There you go. Yeah. And so, well, I'm introducing him because um, uh, there's a particular, uh, not terribly well known, but a remarkably important uh, uh, article by Popper, which is, if I remember correct, a long time, epistemology without the knowing subject. Mm. And uh, in this article, it speaks about you know, how you can do you not know, to your knowledge, epistemology, you know, from what I would consider Popper would have been horrified, but an, an analytic sort of perspective in terms of um, looking at just the no knowledge itself. I mean, the, the dynamics of knowledge, the distribution of knowledge, what we in, in other concepts would be called you know, um, uh, the a, a pro sort of epistemic logic approach to it. So you start seeing the pieces and then all of a sudden I realized, actually this thing is not called knowledge because it's not owned by it, it's called information. Mm -hmm. If you start talking about something out there that I may or may not have, I may or may not send, I may or may not sort of uh, shape, the stuff there of which knowledge is made, uh, I thought, well, this really is information. I, I, and that click with uh, the last element in this conversation, which is a bit personal. Oh, fuck yeah. Am I allowed? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Originally, a long, long, long time ago, uh, but we talked about Luciano in his uh, no, like, teenager, because we studied uh, philosophy in, in high school, my primary interest was philosophy of religion, uh, Kierkegaard. Mm. In particular, uh, huh. yeah, you wouldn't get yeah, exactly so. Um, but what I was interested in, in the first year of my undergraduate studies, the reason why I wanted to study more about logic and philosophy logic and communication theory and so on, I was interested in the um, in how things that today I'm no longer sort of able to say without smiling. Um, how God can send a message to humanity? Yeah. No, the Angel, not the no, Angelos, not the, the messenger, etc. Right, and uh, and so I was interested in understanding from a canon perspective, believe mm. it or not, uh, God's communication with humanity. Not thinking God is a source, humanity is the receiver, and there is a channel. How this channel could work, if it works at all, in order to sort of present a message. Um, mm. The the uh, no, the the good message, you know, the the New Testament, the uh, it, it has the uh, Evangelos, you know, has the same root as yeah, the, the so, Evangelion, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all that uh, was classic studies to do for you. Uh, so put all these pieces together, and then uh, now there's uh, an interesting source and receiver that from a philosophy, religion, miracles, etc. Uh, then there's pop epistemology without uh, no subject. Then there's uh, E.G. Moore and analytic philosophy. There's the mm -hmm. philosophy of logic. And so one day, and that's, that's the end of the story. Uh, I was at, at Wolfson College uh, in Oxford. Uh, I was a postdoc at that point, uh, and I was invited to give a talk in London, open topic. And I really wanted to do something about this stuff that we wouldn't be known afterwards as philosophy of information. Yeah. And I was with someone, uh, there's someone, I don't remember her name at all. That's shame on me. That's the philosopher in you know, typical, like totally folk. I must have bored that poor girl to death. So, <laughs> sitting on the on this uh, little bench, looking at the river, Wilson College, and I said, "You know what? I could call this. I could give a talk called What is the Philosophy of Information?'" Mm. There is no such thing, but I think we should have it. And you know, the next thing I know, they say, "Oh yeah, that's interesting. Why don't you come and give me this talk? What is it like? Well, I, well, we can discover it together." That's the beginning. That's fantastic. That's so cool. My my audience will love that story too, especially about Kierkegaard or Kierkegaard. We have a lot of uh, 
Kierkegaardians in the audience. So that'll be fun. It's it's really fascinating that you wanted to use uh, Shannon information to talk about divine revelation. I think that's that's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I know. you've, it's, you've, it you've was come a long way. Yeah, yeah, you've come a long way since then. But um, yeah, that's away. super Sooner fascinating. Sooner or later, I'll go back to that question. Though. That yeah. is my long, long, long journey. Oh, wow. At some point, I will go back all the way to the question about God. That yeah. is the question. Yeah. Um, Dr. Floridi, uh, maybe this is too personal, but did, have, have you like, um, when you were talking or when you were thinking about that project, were you, were you a, a believer in God yourself and, and are, no. are you not any yeah. longer? Uh, no longer. Uh, so when I, I lost my faith roughly, uh, at that stage during the first second year, uh, it is a four year course. And during the first, second year, I, I realized that I had lost it. Okay. Yeah. It's not that the one day you wake up and say, oh, I don't have faith, faith anymore. Mm. But it, it's like the foundations of a building. Sure. It gets eroded and eroded and eroded. And one day, boom, the whole thing collapses. But that was not the day when it really was undermined. It was right. like a long, long, long process. process. Yeah. I would say uh, between you know, uh, being a late teenager, um, uh, by, by the time I was 17, 18, and, uh, I, I had already almost lost entirely uh, mm. my faith. Having said that, I didn't acquire another faith. Uh, I never became an atheist. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to exchange one belief for another belief. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, people know, I mean, uh, you don't go around. Uh, there's a famous phrase you know, in the philosophy of science that uh, absence of Evidence is not evidence of sound uh, absence. Uh, right. And you know, if you are rigorous enough uh, and serious enough, you should acknowledge that. And, and you know, we, we, we may never know. So I'm, I, I describe myself today as a um, spiritual uh, agnostic. Mm, okay. That, yeah, that's, that's, that's as close as it gets. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for that personal detail. Um, that's, that's really fascinating. I, I hate to do this to you because everyone does, but you kind of, since you invented the philosophy of information, it comes with a territory. Can you help us out? Like what, what is information? There's a bunch of different ways to categorize it. Is there one central core that, that picks out, you know, what information is across different, uh, definitions? Well, first of all, let, let's say, uh, it's a mess. <laughs> That's the number one. So okay. Everybody should start from there because, um, I've seen people talking about information as if, um, Using it uh, most of the time, especially in philosophy, uh, as if it were like the most obvious tool and therefore everybody understands me and all that. So, and then that is where the confusion starts because of course there are many ways in which we understand what the information, uh, is, um, they have in common, um, uh, normally, uh, something, um, and I'll tell you more in, in a moment, but let me start from, uh, since you mentioned the little book, uh, I don't feel guilty in telling people that it's all, it's all in that little book. Yeah. Uh, in the very short introduction. Um, so imagine you're talking about, uh, information in the world mm -hmm. and it could be, um, say the, um, traces, um, left by an animal in the forest. Uh, it could be the usual rings of a tree cut telling you the age of that tree. So that is, um, shall we say the ontological conception of information. And that, when we speak about that, we might be even talking about, you know, since uh, there's, uh, there's been a revival uh, of LPs, you know, uh, the trace that is read uh, by the pin to reproduce music. I mean, that is also a physical trace. And you can point to it like that is information. So in one sense, well, it's a pattern. Hmm. So a lot of people often say, well, look, what, you, what we have here is information because there's a, a pattern that and now we move to the, a different concept. They're all related. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that pattern may have meaning. It's not a, just a random pattern. It's not like, um, say, um, clouds in the sky. Sure. That pattern, for example, the, the pattern or, yeah, on an LP, the uh, engraved pattern read by the, the pin or um, my uh, fingertip. Fingerprint, sorry. Uh, left on, on a glass, et cetera. Yeah. They have meaning, they, they might have consequence, et cetera. When we talk about uh, meaningful patterns, uh, then we start talking about meaningful data. And that is already entering into the realm of uh, semantic information. 
So you're sure. no longer just talking about, oh, oh, there's a particular structure or pattern out there, um, but you're talking about information about something. So it's no longer information as AS, as something, but information about something. That is the usual meaning that we tend to endorse if we're talking about information. But, oh, I, I want to have some information or information desk or I didn't get any information. Uh, so, yeah. oh, information these days is everything. You, know, um, you can't take decisions without information. So, mm. That's what we mean. No? So, uh, content about something else. So, there's a referent and there's content. Content doesn't help if you don't describe that becomes data plus meaning plus syntax. Yeah. So the data have a particular structure and they have a particular meaning. If you move all the way to uh, adding also uh, a, a true value, that is false or, 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 or not, then you have one kind of semantic information, which is uh, the typical factual semantic information that you find in Wikipedia. Yeah. Train, table, sort of uh, information, so on. There's a third kind, which doesn't have a true value, which is no which has a meaning, um, has a structure, which has semantic and syntax, but doesn't have any truth value, and is uh, all the third kind information that we uh, describe as information for something. Imagine music, files. Uh, uh, I send you a file, I send you some information, in one sense. A certain amount of data, which have particular, uh, say, meaning, a particular structure, my bad being zipped or not, etc. But then you open it and does it play music? Well, that is information for something in order to play music. Right. Is it a recipe for a cake? Yeah. Okay, that is information for something. It's an algorithm. It, you, you get the gist. But it's is not it, necessarily vertical or not. You, you wouldn't yeah. say, is this, is this a true is recipe? Is it true or false? Yeah. Right, right. So uh, people, no, we, we use true meaning genuine at that, but not philosophy. Yeah, right. debate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, is it that, is it really your, your, your true grandma's recipe is that right, right. genuine one? Yes. If we are careful. So information as something in the world, information about something, uh, semantic, factual, and information for something, which is more the algorithmic kind. Once you have these three, there's a, there's, that's a big step forward in terms of understanding what we're talking. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, and, and some other, so information in the book, it's information as reality, information for, information about reality, um, exactly. or for, for the world. I, I love this distinction. It's been really helpful um, for me in thinking about um, get, getting clear, because a lot of people will conflate these, uh, especially on the more popular level, and then say like, well, everything just is information, but they mean information about reality. It's that that type of information. Everything is that. Um, I wonder if all information, I don't know another word to say for, except for like intentionality. The, the information about reality has a, a particular intentionality. It's this information is about whatever thing is out there in the world. Maybe it's like representational. When I think of information as reality and I think about either fingerprints or rings on a tree, is there an, an intentionality to that type of information? Like uh, the rings in the, in the tree, is that about the age of the tree or anything? No, not really. There's a, there's a correlation that we can exploit. Okay. So we can correlate uh, some, uh, something in the world, say A has a particular feature F, and, uh, uh, which is correlated to something else B having another feature G. Okay. And so if you, um, uh, that particular, the, the, the tree cut has you know, that feature, those rings, which is correlated to the same tree having a particular age. But that correlation um, is what we exploit in terms of then acquiring the information about the tree. It would be a little bit funny, but let me put it this way, uh, yeah. to say, oh, oh, the tree meant to send us a message. Yeah. Uh, I, know. I imagine that uh, you have some uh, unknown uh, ancient land that you discover on an island, yeah. an undiscovered island tomorrow, and a dead civilization. But we find signs that have clearly a structure. That is the first hallmark of information. Yeah. This thing repeats, it has a regularity, things come with that syntax. You see the syntax, you actually see the, not the, the patterns. You, st you start thinking, these patterns are not natural. They have been put there by someone. You infer that there must be a meaning, a semantics. They are sending us a message or they are sending a message. They are broadcasting a message. You need to crack that particular sort of uh, code. 
Right. Uh, uh, we need to be careful sometimes we'll be too metaphorical um, and say, oh, the, 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 the rings in the tree is a, is a code for uh, yeah. metaphors. Let's be careful. Uh, the tree doesn't say anything, doesn't want to tell us anything. Um, this is also useful when it, when it comes to AI. Uh, yeah, no matter cool. what you get, yeah. it is still you know, patterns. AI didn't mean to say anything, didn't uh, did have a plan, did it have an intention. Uh, it's just that, no, with all those correlations, um, on this side, you can tell the age of the tree. Uh, but don't confuse you know, the, the tree and its intentionality with what we do with that pattern. That's, that's really helpful. So um, in, in diving down on that point a little bit deeper, so um, I posted about having a conversation with you, and I just mentioned um, environmental information kind of to gin up uh, interest in the in the conversation and, and a philosopher of science uh was was uh, i would say she was triggered she she was like well you dendrochronologists uh have to do so much work to de derive the information out of the tree rings and so tree rings are not identical to information and in my head i'm thinking you know the the whole i, I go in for john searle's uh observer relativity argument so i i like that i think there needs to be an observer to be to be able to interpret the information like you said, there's no, the tree doesn't have its own intentionality, but it seems like the whole idea of dendrochronology of finding the age of a tree from tree rings presupposes that there is information in there to be correlated at least, right? Uh, you, you could put it the other way around. Uh, it goes around until you find something that is such that the correlation helps us to do it. I mean, it might have done, not science fiction, it might have turned out that not those, those rings don't tell anything about the age. I mean, there is something, of course, about those all the identity of the individual. I mean, um, not with the fingerprints. Um, the tree had that structure because by living in a particular environment, etc., accumulates right. those particular features that are you know, slowly sedimenting into its so uh, particular rings. So there is a, a direct correlation between age and you know, time, if you like, you know, of growth, rings you know, uh, growing, and us being able to as we reverse engineer the rings, not back to the age. Right. So it's not magic, there's nothing uh, strange. But it, we could imagine, for example, it's a little bit like reading in archaeology, reading uh, a particular site and the strata of the, uh, the, the, uh, the archaeological strata and say, no, this belongs to, say, this, this particular age of humanity. And then, I don't know, it's, it's a, like many thousand years old um, set. Uh, and no, this was like 10,000 10, years, then it's 6,000 years of it. Well, why? Oh, well, because those are the, uh, the artifacts. Those are, are the particular, say, geological um, events that enable us to date. So there is something there that helps us to acquire the information about the... Yeah, it is tricky, oh, and that's why you know, we find so much confusion, because people, because we use uh, um, information as reality, uh, almost as if the information were there and just needed to be discovered. Yeah as if we were digging out the information from there, we confuse this with, um, imagine a different example, uh, a radio sending a signal from, uh, imagine we receive a signal, a radio signal from another galaxy. Mm -hmm. it has been traveling, I don't know, for a million of years and uh, their civilization is dead. I mean, that could, that's no science fiction. I mean, that could happen. Totally. Way more than not other things. Uh, we cannot travel faster than light, but we could receive one day, that would be, Astonishing. I mean, would it be a change in human history? But imagine that we get that radio signal. Um, that reconstruction is completely different. That is not reading uh, so, uh, ring trees or finding my finger prints on, uh, on a glass. Yeah. Someone somewhere broadcast that. Uh, and so there's a, then we're back to, to the real thing, you know, to the source, the message, and the receiver. That is much more Shannon. Mm. But this, the tree is not sending anything. Uh, yeah. We are able to interpret that particular pattern in such a way that we can sort of uh, leverage the pattern to reconstruct backwards the age of the tree. Or, for example, the presence of, say, someone on, on a crime scene because uh, the, to some extent, uh, the fingerprints were there. And then, of course, Sherlock Holmes shows that, no, he wasn't there with someone yeah. else. Someone put the glass there, the guy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Dr. Flirty, um, I wonder if the situation changes uh, if 
uh, if I leave my fingerprint on a glass with the intention of leaving my unique fingerprint, so maybe maybe I'm kidnapped, but I, I, I press it on there so that someone can find this and say, oh, Parker's been here. Does that change the um, information from like environmental to, uh, I don't know, like, like analog or to, does it have intentionality now because I've intended to communicate through my unique fingerprint? Yes. Yeah, so um, what we have changed, uh, and you, I think you find that also in the, in the book, uh, we have changed, if you like, the interface okay. through which we're looking at that piece of information. Uh, in computer science, it's called level of abstraction, but um, we don't have to be sort of too fancy. I mean, we can call it interface. So if you're looking, for example, at a, uh, with the interface of the police looking for someone who has, might have been kidnapped, uh, or say, uh, I, I'm lost in a forest and I start leaving you know, uh, pieces of my clothes here, 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 here. Yeah. Imagine that scenario versus uh, I'm in a forest and I'm losing bits of my stuff. No, my, my, let me, let me do it like more, more um, uh, intelligent. My backpack, uh, I have a backpack. There's a hole, I'm losing pieces in a forest. I'm in a forest, I'm lost, I'm trying to be found. So I'm intentionally leaving pieces in the forest. From an interface that doesn't have, why am I asking this question for, doesn't have a purpose. The two phenomena are identical. Essentially, all I know is that someone is in the park and is leaving, and there's the remnants, you know, bits of the you know, uh, backpack uh, left. Is he meant to be found? Is he lost? Does he just have a hole in the backpack and <laughs> losing stuff as he goes? That is intentional. That is what we do in terms of interpretation, um, which is cool. Uh, but we need to be able to distinguish this from what do we have in front of us. Now, sometimes, and I hope I'm, I'm not confusing things uh, too much. Now, in philosophy of science, we speak of how data underdetermine the theory. Yeah. In other words, you can have many, many data points, and you can reconstruct sometimes those data points in more than one way, often. Yeah. Well, that's the same story about the, me losing bits of stuff in, in, uh, uh, in the park. Uh, am I trying to be found, or, or, or just have a hole in my backpack? Uh, yes. So, of course, if the police thinks that I'm lost, etc., everybody will interpret that as an attempt to be found. But it might be just an accident. I just got lucky. And mm -hmm. without me knowing, uh, I left a trace and people find it. Fantastic. That, that's helpful. So, um, so I understand, I think I, I think I understand information if you, if you want to analyze it in terms of uh, data and meaning, because then we can go in on data and we can say, well, data are made of uh, uh, bits, which is just like one unit. And I understand that in the binary uh, conversation, I'm not sure. I understand it in a physical um, information as reality understanding. What what would a what would a bit be in the physical world? Yeah. Oh no. Well, well. First of all, the the bit normally that's an, again an unfortunate um, difficult word to to use um, can either be uh, part of the code that we use in order to you know, code some information. Oh, sure. So imagine like the telegraph. No dot line dot line dot line. So is the world, uh, is, is uh, the hamlet made of dot? That? No, of course not. But we can transform the whole hamlet into da -da 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 and transmit <laughs> this on the other side of the Atlantic, you know, good old days. <laughs> so the bit is that, is a code, or very rarely is something you find in the world. I mean, the world doesn't tend to be binary the, uh, the, way, the way we experience it. Uh, we normally experience it as a continuum analog as in you know, there's always something in between something else um uh there was um uh, this famous uh phrase you know, uh, nature doesn't make jumps uh, mm. uh well the fact that it doesn't make jumps means you know if you translate it into 21st century nature is not binary um mm. it doesn't move from zero to one or from yes no uh high low so uh current uh, electricity in the circuit uh, Hole or no hole on a CD, etc. Et so if we are not talking about the code, but we're talking about the sort of information, if you like, in reality, out there as reality, that normally is analog. Uh, imagine a map. Okay. So you have a map. That map is con is continuous. Uh, it's all line uh, lines and say the, the the underground map, so that you can travel from one point to the next. Um, the extraordinary revolution that we have undergone uh, 
roughly, uh, if you want to have a hero, we can pick up Alan Turing, but no, it comes earlier, Babbage, uh, but even Leibniz, Hobbes, yeah. is that we found a way of encoding every kind of information in the world, waves including, so continuum, into discrete uh, elements, that's your code, and we have machines that can handle the code automatically. In fact, today we have machines that not only can handle the code automatically, but they can do so by learning from the app. And that's not AI. Their evolution has been extraordinary because at that point, uh, in a few steps, which are not historically amazing, you have from the analog continuous world to the digital not binary world, to a machine that can handle that uh, efficiently more and more and more to the extent that that machine through statistics can also find the fundamental patterns in the original analog, imagine English or the English spoken, mm -hmm. and start digging out from the deepest no, uh, so, uh, well of structures in that language, patterns that can be reused for us to do useful work. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't know, translate this into that. Well, that is not a, a journey that has been almost uh, a miracle. Now, if you pass me the so dangerous <laughs> analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to me, that is the, the extraordinary uh, journey uh, from, so say, from the first computer to uh, chat GPT. Yeah. Thinking about, uh, oh, we're creating some kind of form of intelligence here that is, is almost like not getting how big the transformation is. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's almost like saying like, uh, you are belittling the extraordinary human ingenuity that went into all these steps. And instead you think that you know, by clicking something that yeah. you're not quite sure, these black boxes, all of a sudden, boom, intelligence arises. It's not the way it works. That's amazing. Okay. I've never thought of it that way. I, I was listening to you earlier and you talked about you, now, it, now everything clicks for me where you're saying, um, the thing about AI is from one of your lectures is that we no longer have to be, we no longer have to use intelligence to park a car for, uh, you know, uh, self-driving cars or to play chess. And you, that you is no longer. And that is a really big deal. It's, it's, you've it's outmoded true. intelligence and that's yeah. huge. That shows how intelligent we are, that we're yeah. able to do that. But yeah. when you say, no, that thing has to be intelligent because it's doing what we do. Now you've actually belittled the achievement of the programmers and such. Exactly. Uh, if you think in terms of, um, extraordinary, remarkable, powerful, benign or not intelligence, you belong to, uh, to the past. You're still a modern in a bad sense of modern, uh, there's a good <laughs> sense, but in a bad sense of modern, sure. uh, think you still, you still stuck with Frankenstein. Okay. Mm -hmm. The reproduction of ourselves one way or another, they may or may not take over, may be I, may or may not. But the, the Frankenstein, uh, the golem myth, um, that is not quite getting the way more, it seems to me, interesting revolution, which is extraordinary. And you no, know, you, one way of putting it, as you said, is to, for the first time in human history, we have been able to decouple successful agency and intelligence. Yeah. That has never happened before. I mean, we have never managed to do something successfully in view of a goal, improving at zero intelligence. So that's what I normally say, I tell no, students here, that, look, imagine parking a car at zero intelligence. <laughs> Don't yeah. do that with, no, with your parents' car. They will not be pleased. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Or imagine cooking at zero intelligence uh, or doing the dishes at zero intelligence, playing yeah. chess at zero intelligence. But warehousing at zero intelligence, okay? Uh, just or uh, collecting strawberries. I'm, I'm actually referring to actual industrial applications. Building a car at zero intelligence. Impossible. Yeah. The mess, the disaster, the cost will be all over the place. Today we have, as we speak, not like, oh, one day. That's a, no, no. For years now, we have had machines that can do that successfully and improving because, of course, they learn from their output uh, to get uh, their output as an input in, so that their performance gets yeah. better and better up to a point where we are not completely satisfied. I mean, the parking is perfect. The, no, the strawberries are collected in the most efficient and effective way, et cetera. Yeah. That divorce between agency and intelligence, 
that is historical. And allow me for you know, this extra little uh, look into the future. That is where the problems are. The challenges, the opportunities, but also the problems. Now, when we, th- when we talk about the ethics of AI, uh, uh, the real point here is in that sort of gap between agency and intelligence that we are generating and increasing, in that gap, you find all the difficulties, the privacy, the, the bias, the copyright and intellectual property, um, the control uh, over uh, resources, uh, the exploitation, um, keep going, it, no, the fake, uh, deep fake, exactly. it's all there. In the fact that we can actually, as you know, for, for the past few years, we've been able to do things remarkably successfully, more and more at zero intelligence. So that is the thing that we should be understanding much better and designed much better. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I've I've been thinking. Of, um, I'm in a class right now on the the philosophy of artificial intelligence, and and I've been thinking about trying to come up with some kind of distinction because I know that the the AI folks over on the computer science side of things they don't like the word artificial intelligence because they think it's genuine intelligence. And I think it's perfect. It's a perfect word. It is artificial. It's it's a representation of the intentions of the programmer. But I wonder I wonder if you would put um, like booby traps in the same uh, category as like a self-driving car, like, you know, think back to maybe a bronze age booby trap. Someone steps on this, uh, so something in a dart shoots into their chest. Uh, is that, is that still, uh, agency without intelligence in the same way, just a more rudimentary form or no? No. So, uh, this is also another topic where we need a few distinctions, but, um, the kind of, uh, artificial intelligence that we have, uh, and, uh, and we have had it for a while, but this one is, you no know, the sort of uh, statistical kind, as opposed to the you know, didactic kind that we had in the past, uh-huh. it's way more powerful. Um, it's the ability to learn. That is the kind of agency uh, we're talking about. That's right. Uh, the booby trap doesn't learn. Yeah. It's the same way in which the, an earthquake is a form of agency, but not the kind that we're talking about because the, the, an earthquake doesn't learn. It's not that today you say, oh no, you, I'm really an evil force. I want to do more damage. Next time I do a better <laughs> job. And I can, uh, no, I, I wait you know, for everybody to sleep and then I go. So, no, of course not. But if you think of, um, imagine uh, forms of agency, and this is uh, for anyone who's listening, this is completely unorthodox. Uh, don't try this at home. Um, and you no, know, I've been criticized. In fact, one of the reviewers of the Ethics of AI, uh, the, the last book that I published for UP, when I make this distinction, said that this was complete bonkers. So <laughs> luckily, luckily, I had enough replies to say that. Uh, they hadn't quite understood what I was talking about. But here we go. So, an orthodox. Imagine agency coming in degrees. Okay. Something very, very poor. No, no, like low degree, high degree. The highest degree uh, is probably the one that is omnipotent. No? Imagine God no? that can do anything, learn anything, know anything. But it could go for a moment. Uh, for no, and On this planet, what we have is um, interaction with the world. If you make a difference in the world, then you are already an agent. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we talk about atmospheric agents for that reason. Yeah. Rain, earthquake, a river, a river that no, goes from the mountain all the way to the, to, uh, to the sea is an agent, uh, for good or bad. Because, because it has one condition, the minimal condition makes a difference in the world. Mm-hmm. Change. So interaction. Then you have good old days, uh, something in between uh, that uh, your average animal, um, say a dog. Uh, a dog can learn. It can also have intentions. You know, it, uh, it means to survive, for example. Uh, it will stay away from uh, danger. Um, it will not like uh, another bigger dog uh, coming. As that. So there's, there's both learning and let's call it intentionality. Okay. And of course, the highest degree of that is the human being, where there is all this and the ability to overcome all this, not only all this, but also say the conscious ability to control all this and say, you know what? I want to commit suicide. The dog will not, uh, or, you know what? I don't have to be afraid of something. Um, or, you know, I can keep my hand, uh, my finger for 30 seconds on the flame of a candle. How many stupid jokes have we done when we were kids? Like, because I want to, uh, yeah. a dog. So that kind of conscious control, it's, uh, that comes as an extra form of agency. 
Mm-hmm. Now, these were the three. Now, the river, the dog, and me. And that's life on, on planet Earth since you know, we came out of the, the caves. Today, there is a fourth player. Mm-hmm. Something that is not like the river, only because he's interactive, but he can learn. It's not like the dog because it doesn't have intention. It's not like I'm going to say, oh, no, uh, I don't feel like uh, eating this today. Uh, and then, oh, I bark because I want to go out uh, for a walk. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, it doesn't have that intentionality and certainly doesn't have you know, the conscious self control, planning. Uh, you know, in two years, I want to go and you know, explore the Amazonian uh, real exact. So there's a fourth kind of agency here which we have encountered in the past, for which we don't have conceptual tools up to it. What happens? That some people will think of this just as another form of agency interaction. It's a tool. It's no more than, say, a drill, okay? It's no more than a car. The river kind of agency. Uh, it does what it does, I control it. Bad idea. Uh-uh. At least my old car, no, the new one learns, uh, but the old yeah. one didn't, didn't learn. Right. I said, oh, no, it's a new form. It's, it's almost like a dog. You know, it's growing. It has the, 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 it's, it's like a five-year-old child, etc. The technology, the science we have should be good enough to tell us that they at least admit that this is not the case today. I think it's bongos anyway, but no, sure. we're talking about my iPhone, okay? Uh, or we're talking about ChatGPT. Uh, it's certainly not like us. So we need to admit that we have a new player, uh, mm-hmm. uh, that the game has become a little bit more complicated. Uh, we build it, we control it, uh, or at least we have the responsibility of controlling it. We can turn it on and off. Um, it can do things uh, that are, are amazing. It can learn from its own performance. It's not like a river, it's not like a dog, it's not like a human being. What we need is a bit of work from mm-hmm. philosophers understanding this new form of agency. That is the opening that I would find exciting. Uh, any uh, researcher listening to this, I mean, you have an amazing topic in, in your hands. Yeah. This is the 21st century. If you try to reduce this form of agency to, oh, but really some kind of intelligent, you know, just not wider, you're just stuck with a, no, I don't want to admit that something entirely new has really happened. I have an old model. My hermeneutics is still modern and all I have are these three categories. So it has to be one, two, or three. It's, since it's not a river and it's not like a, uh, it must be la- or either like a dog or like a human being. Yeah. Open up. Yeah. Think in terms of welcome to a fourth kind. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable. I mean, we engineer this uh, problem solving task, uh, uh, caring um, artifacts. This, 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 um, this, the, even the question of agency is so, so tough to think about. And like it, it, uh, puts an exclamation point on your idea that we need to have better concepts for this, this, this new thing. Cause I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's some literature on group agency. And so is, is ChatGPT like a group agent? Because I'm interacting with, I don't know, 3.5, but there's also four. What's the connection between those two? And also if, if I'm using it at the same time you are, is this, does it make sense to even call it like an agent? You know what I mean? Like, uh, we, we don't want to say it's intelligent, but I think the AI folks say, well, intelligence is a functional concept and it's just, you know, solving, yeah. solving puzzles. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, how do we think uh, of that? so about intelligence at some point, if it becomes just a matter of vocabulary, I'm happy with any vocabulary. I mean, okay. uh, you could call it a genius as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. I, yeah. I don't care. Sure. Um, the question is what that, um, the consequences of that, um, choice of vocabulary because um for example if then you start getting worried that it might take over the universe and domain well that's silly okay Okay. Uh, but if i call say this pen intelligent because you know the more i use it the less ink i can see here that's very intelligent yeah okay fine so as of tomorrow not this this intelligent pen right yeah it doesn't matter yeah and a lot of that it's it's Advertisement is hype, is selling yeah. the product. So let's, let's be a bit more philosophical about it. Yeah. We want to be careful about the words because the words have consequences. They have implications. And intelligence, although we don't have a definition, and by the way, for anyone curious, just, just look uh, around and see how many disciplines have defined in how many ways so intelligence. Hard. Yeah. It, it's a joke. 
Yeah. So, um, so the real question becomes, oh, if we don't have a, 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 a definition for intelligence, uh, what are we talking about? Well, we do have some criteria. And you want to know whether these criteria are here being uh, deployed or not. For example, um, stop playing a game because something else is more important all of a sudden. Hmm. You're playing chess with a computer, uh, computer's winning or you're winning, so it doesn't matter. But at some point you actually stop because maybe say, the, the, the fire alarm goes on. So, yeah. Go, go, go. So the computer will keep playing. It will win the game <laughs> and burn with the house. Yeah. Uh, so intelligence, for example, is also a matter of flexibility. There is mm. social intelligence. There is musical intelligence. There is that intuitive intelligence that lets you sort of postpone some news to a friend because today is not the right day. Mm. Uh, so normally, when people ask me, "Oh, well, so what is intelligence?" Intelligence is all the times no. Uh, is the counterpart of all the forms of stupidity that we can have mm. today. Mm. If it was stupid, no, to leave the passport at home when you're flying, it would have been intelligent no, to take the passport when you're flying. If it is huh. stupid to leave the, the finger in the door when you close the door of your car, oh, that was stupid, yes. So it would have been intelligent not to leave the finger there. there. If it is stupid to think that 2 plus 2 is 22, then it's intelligent to think that 2 plus 2 is 24. If it was stupid to say that thing to that friend today, really, Parker, don't you know? No, uh, Laura, I said, uh, uh, or John, I said, terrible day. You could have, that was stupid. It would have been intelligent not to. You, you read a newspaper, you can't summarize it. Really? Oh, that's stupid. Like, it's intelligence not mm. to read the newspaper. But then, you know, the variety of things uh, that we call intelligent is almost boundless. Yeah. Because it's another way of saying being human, uh, uh, having a, a, a successful mental life. And that is not something you can pinpoint like uh, a definition like uh, water equal H2O. Because that is science and it's good science. But that's when we have irregimented vocabularies that can handle you know, concepts that are clear and precise. Mm. In this case, we have an archipelago of islands. Uh, you can call the archipelago Maldives, but no island is the Maldives. Mm. Uh, and that would be silly. Yeah. It's the whole archipelago. Uh, yeah. And people say, oh, okay, well, no, I'm kind of getting it. Um, let me give you another analogy. It's like people looking for the, uh, the border between Italy and France. Is it in France or is it in Italy? It's a border. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, but it has to be somewhere. No, it's what makes one different from the other. Uh, it's that line that is neither here nor there because if you pass it, you are in one place and you don't. So you need to be a little bit more, so, uh, in, shall we say intelligent, flexible, uh, yeah. mentally. And then, uh, the whole question, you know, is this machine intelligent or not becomes either trivial or misformulated. Trivial, mm -hmm. because like, depends on what you mean by intelligence. If, for example, it, it runs calculations, well, my pocket calculator is intelligent. It can do maths like no one else I know. So amazing. Huh? Yeah. Uh, or uh, uh, is misformulated because we don't have uh, that archipelago doesn't apply at all. It's comparing uh, oranges and apples. Yeah. And I find most of the discussion about the philosophy of AI of that kind, like either trivial or pointless. Hmm. That's fascinating. I, I think that your your three main ways of talking about information are, are super helpful. Uh, I, I I haven't seen them used a lot in AI conversations, but Maybe that's, it would tamp down a lot of the hype as well, because you're saying like, no, you, you're, you're mixing categories. You're, you're saying you're talking about information for reality in these algorithms as if it were information as reality or, you know, or something else. You're, you're, you're mixing categories. I, exactly. I wonder. Then, that, that's very well put. No, the, mixing those categories generates yeah. confusion to no end and worries yeah. about something that honestly is like zombies. Yeah. I'm not worried about zombies. I'm not worried about AI in the sense of zombies. I'm worried yeah. about humans using AI a lot. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's just straight up equivocation. It's, this is a helpful tool for showing that we're, we're equivocating on the term, uh, intelligence maybe, or, or AI. I, I wonder there's a, I want to get into some of the goofy stuff, the more out there <laughs> type stuff. Um, I think your, I think you can actually help me a lot with thinking about the extended mind, uh, thesis of, of Chalmers and Clark. So you, you talked about Karl Popper's paper 
um, epistemology without the knowing subject and how you thought, actually, that's not knowledge, that's information. I wonder, um, are our thoughts in, in my mind right now, whatever the mind is, are they more analog or digital? Are they more like a record or more like a CD? And then I have some following uh, questions after that. So, uh, of course, the brain is, uh, is an analog engine, uh, yeah. uh, uh, not least because um, uh, everything works in terms of uh, how much blood it gets or not at the end yeah, of the yeah. day. And uh, uh, there's a lot uh, that can be um, uh, represented uh, and was represented a lot in the past as uh, uh, digital in terms of neurons. Yeah. They fire, they don't fire. Yes. However, uh, now we discover, for example, that uh, there are waves uh, of firing mm. uh, that determine also uh, our uh, neurological uh, life the, the yeah. processes. Um, so, in a way, it's a little bit like asking whether music is digital or analog. Mm. These are two codes, and uh, uh, you can encode music as analog and digital. Um, yeah. Uh, every time you do that, you may or may not uh, uh, lose something. It may be lost less, or uh, it may be lost. You know, uh, you may actually keep keep translating, and at the end, it's almost unrecognizable. But, uh, you must have seen this uh, this experiment run actually by uh, my wife is a neuroscientist. Uh, she's uh, she's a professor of neuroscience. Here. She was a chair of neuroscience in Oxford. And we came together to Yale, and she's now the director of the neuroscience uh, center here at Yale. And, in your science and a friend of ours, a friend of hers in particular, a friend of mine, by proxy mm -hmm. at the University of Berkeley, um, they ran this experiment and they tried uh, to reconstruct what people were listening to yeah. by looking, you know, and then it turned out there was uh, the war Pink Floyd. I don't know if you have uh, actually heard, no, listened to, it, they had kind of, they had to tell you that it's Pink Floyd because like, it was like, yeah. Okay, it, it's barely recognizable, but it's okay. impressive. Okay. And then people say, oh my goodness, AI reads the mind. Yes, like, right. My, how, how confused can you be? Well, first of all, this is a bit of a trick. Um, yeah. We've been able to do that for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just that we do this much, much better now. Uh, the second thing is waves out. An analog uh, brain no, collects those waves. You register the waves of the brain, and it's, this is basically translation from one code to another code to another code to another code. Okay. Of course, it's very lossy. You lose a lot enormously because from what was the actual sound to what we get through uh, the vibration of our eardrums in the brain, and the, and then what the brain is encoding in terms of these vibrations. Then what comes out, you know that is. Pink Floyd, because you know what it was, what came in. Right, right. Uh, you see what I mean? Like, so, yeah. It's not like you, you could interpret that if you didn't know that that was what came in. Sure. Anyway, so translation, and, and if you know how, how much neuroscience has done these days, um, that should not be surprising. But back to your question, therefore, um, are we talking about an analog or digital world? Um, I think that uh, as a Kantian, I find it uh, a misplaced um, uh, question. What we need, what we have, um, is um, signals that come to the world, which we can encode as digital or analog. But we can switch all the time. Mm. Now, if you think that this is too fancy, uh, remember that uh, light is light, photons. Depending on the frame, they look like points or a wave. Sure. And asking whether light is a wave. No, continuous, or yeah. made of points, uh, one, 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 the, like bullets, uh, means not having understood the, no, what you're talking about. Yeah. Because it, it is one or the other or both, depending on the, uh, essentially, uh, interface that you put between you and the light. Well, so the, so the connection to the external mind thesis is, is um, look, I, I have a, a notebook, and this, these are all my thoughts about your work, and they <laughs> are a, a guide for me to, uh, you know, it's like my, my active memory or something like that. And they, they seem like they're, they're representations of my thoughts, but I'm wondering, you know, are, are, are notes in a notebook, 
do they count as analog or digital? And I would think they would be digital, even though it sounds weird because we say it's an analog notebook, but it's mm. not. I, it, it really is uh, a question of interpretation. It, uh, it, okay. Um, it, it, unless you ask what that question is for, mm -hmm. um, there is no way of answering it yes or no independently. Uh, well, so, so Chalmers and uh, Clark would say that, um, perhaps, you know, maybe our mind is extended out into the notebook because our, our thoughts are there and they use, you know, an example of uh, an Alzheimer's patient who uses their notebook to yeah. guide themselves throughout the world. And they say, well, you know, in a very real sense, this is, uh, and I don't know how, with the sense they talk about, they don't say whether it's metaphorical or analogical or, or univocal, but they want you to think that this is like, it, the, the conclusion is that like, this is, your mind isn't just in your skull, it extends into your, yeah. wherever your thoughts go. Yeah, no, I think, I think is that, is a, uh, the way I read it is a, is a, uh, nice metaphor um anything more than that and i would be very critical um first of all because um uh i never seen i never touch i never sort of kick a mind i mean mind if you start thinking your mind almost like a liquid in your brain that you know, kind of uh, pours out and makes everything wet around you sure that's a bad idea yeah now uh we have a mental life um uh, and for people who think that this is a bit strange, imagine uh, someone say, look, the world uh, is made of objects and actions and properties of objects. So there are cars, cars can be red or, or and can go, can run. That's great. What is mental there? The mental, with the analogy, is how. Mm -hmm. So imagine, uh, basically, the mental is an adverb. We don't, we don't have a mind. We live mindfully. Mm. If you have an, uh, pass me this, this, this oversimplification, but if you have a, a adverbial idea of mind and, as in my case, you think that a second order ontology of that kind uh, is really what matters, that things are not, they're not things and then property of things and then interactions between things, but actually they are relations that constitute things, mm -hmm. then uh, there is mindfulness that gets, or, or, or living mindfully, uh, that gets incarnated, if you like, in you, in me, or the new baby, or someone else. Um, then the picture is really almost upside down. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I find that you know, philosophically more convincing, because mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, create a ontology of something like a mind out of thin air. Yeah. Uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, it's like, like, imagine with a different analogy, no, so, uh, I, which I hope is a bit more intuitive. Um, I think it's the same story. I'm huh? sorry. Democracy. Mm -hmm. I live in a democracy. Well, actually, you live in a house. This mm -hmm. democracy thing? Oh, 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 you live in a place where actions and interactions are democratic. Oh, you live democratically. Now I understand. Mm -hmm. Or someone runs, runs quickly. Okay, where is the quickly? Uh, what, please, no, point to, if you start looking at a thing based ontology, yeah. when in fact you're talking about uh, ways and relational ways of not existing, the confusion leads to some kind of really funny things like, oh, my mind is out there, uh, right? Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. I understand the metaphor, um, yeah. but it would be much more interesting to say that in a, in a life lived mindfully, of course, I am the node at the center of this network, mm -hmm. but the mindfulness you know, is not just this node, uh, it's all the relations that I have yeah. uh, with the network. Yeah. So. Final analogy. So, in case anyone thinks like this guy makes no sense whatsoever, um, it's like thinking in terms of um, roundabouts and um, or crossroads, if you prefer. Roundabouts is a very English way. Uh, crossroads and roads, and ask people what comes first, the crossroad or the road. It was like, oh, the the roads. Uh, crossroads is where the roads uh, happen to be. I was like, well, that's my mind. My mind is a crossroad, mm -hmm. is a roundabout, <clears throat> is where 
everything that interacts in a certain way, uh, my past memories, my way of speaking English, my, uh, my life, my experiences, my feelings, my current state of the body, all these relations, all these ways of being come together. Mm -hmm. And it's very concrete. I mean, don't cross the roundabout without stopping, checking, and going. It's yeah. totally concrete. But thinking in terms of first roundabouts, first the mind, and then a mindful uh, sort of existence, is to put the crossroads first and then build the roads to connect them. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it, it makes no sense. If we have a relational ontology, and I, I know that this is maybe going down a rabbit trail, but uh, so we, we don't have to if you, if you don't want to, but it, it, uh, I have the substance uh, ontologist folks in my head that they're, they're, they're saying, you know, a relation is a relation between things. So if yes. you have a relation without things, it's like, well, what are we even talking about? And it's like the chicken and the egg. Agreed. So uh, here we need two steps. Well, first of all, there is a way, which not a two-step, there's a way of doing um, what's called structural realism uh, in philosophy of yep. science. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do that in an informational way that tries to solve not both, both the chicken and the egg. Uh, yeah. But that is a bit visualized and for the folks you know, uh, listening to this, you know, just looking at informational structural realism and as, mm -hmm. that's the rule you can take. We, we, yeah, but we like, did a whole episode on that for folks interested. There you go. Yeah, uh, with your mint. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty precise. But uh, let's keep it uh, uh, simple and straightforward uh, on an everyday, not, not philosophy of science, but everyday experience. So you can really have two kinds here, at least two kinds of, of way of speaking about reality. One is I have access. Like I look, I check, maybe with tools, maybe with science, maybe with theory, but I have the means to tell you what the world is like. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe improvable, maybe, but there is, that possibility is open. The other one that says, look, forget about what is out there. What is out there is, you can see where I'm going, is sending signals to us. Yeah. What we get are the signals. The signals is what build our own ontology. Uh -huh. My ontology, which is you know, this talking to you, this pen in my head, is the result, the outcome of this particular receiver processing those particular signals so that this is the reality in which you know, I uh, and living. And it's completely real. I mean, the signals are real, the, everything is concrete. I mean, I'm not going like, oh, there's no real reality. No, forget about it. That's enough. We'll leave sure. that to childish games and games played by <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about the real life, the, the life when you go to the, to the grocery and come back. What kind of reality are we talking about? The metaphysical one, reality in itself, for the Kantians, the noumenon, or the outcome of my interactions with the world through this particular interface, epistemically speaking, that is my body, blah, 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 blah my culture and so on, my language, and the outcome of that, call that ontology. Once you have that distinction, I'm getting to the chicken and egg. Uh, no, this is, chick, this is really yeah, helpful. The, the chicken and egg problem is for the metaphysician. Uh -huh. The metaphysician who wants to tell you what the world is in itself, independently of my or a human or the, a particular interface or anything, uh, as if he had you know, a God's eye perspective on the world, classic, yeah. you know, it has to tell you what the foundational bits are and what comes first and what comes later. So roundabouts, you know, things and their relations between things, nodes and related, and they don't know. I mean, they, they just, they've been running in circles because yeah. of course, chicken and egg, blah, blah. No, well, and, and because because um, if if we do take a Kantian picture, it's like well, you're trying to escape your own mind, right? You're, if you're yeah. if you're going for transcendental exactly. ideas, so you're also coping your own language, your own categories, or view from. But the no, world. think in terms of trying to do metaphysics, try to do ontology, mm. meaning okay, how do we come up? What's the best model that we can get of this epistemic ontology that we have on our side? Mm. And here, the beauty of modeling something is that you can decide. Yeah. You can say, let's decide that we start modeling because it makes more sense, it's more fruitful, it's more explanatory. Mm. It's more, let's decide that we start with lines, not with points. Yeah. And then you start on the whiteboard saying, okay, line, that's a relation. And relation links A and B. I've just done it. Oh, you just got out of the chicken. Well, it's just saying, how do I want to model the relationship between egg and chicken? I'm going to start chronologically, made more sense to start with, it, uh, with the egg and then the chicken. Yeah. Oh, but in real life, I'm not doing metaphysics. That's, <laughs> your, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. the steps are epistemic ontology, not a metaphysical approach. Yeah. 
and on the epistemic ontology, realize that we have to model that epistemic ontology philosophically in order to understand it. And because in modeling, you're actually designing what you need, yeah. you can start look, wherever the heck <laughs> yeah. you want. Yeah. Well, I wonder, if, in, can you, so some people want to take the epistemic uh, ontology and then run it, run it back into metaphysics and say, um, well, information is a neutral monism then, right? Because look at, look at all the work we can do epistemically with information and, and the signals that we receive. So it looks like, let's just say that the noumenal realm just is information, right? Uh, is that what's yeah. going on? In, it, what, what do you make of that, that so project? You, so you can, uh, there is, there is um, freedom, so to speak. So you can, uh, um, uh, oh, to use fine terminology, your ontological commitment can go much, much further and say, look, I have an epistemic ontology. It works very well. In fact, my epistemic ontology works so well that I can put robots on Mars. So that's a good, solid no, no, way of understanding the signal that, that the ultimate nominal source is sending to me, interpreting them in the best way, such an extent they're successful. No, uh, and, and therefore, there's instrumental successfulness in <laughs> my no, humanity. So in the way uh, the human uh, sort of, uh, epistemic ontology works, totally fine. Do I have to say next step, and that's the way the world is? Well, if you like, but that is an act of faith. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. it, there's nothing that forces you to say that. Okay. I mean, you, no, you're welcome. <laughs> um, but in a way, you know, as any good scientist, scholar, philosopher, what we should do is to stay within what is guaranteed by our understanding. Everyone. Yeah. If we want to say, over and above what we have reasons to believe that, oh, there's so much more. So essentially is, is a friction free commitment, like yes or not. I mean, it's, it's, is it anyone, no, uh, uh, game, um, yeah. and we don't have to, uh, we, we are free from, uh, so normally a commitment is required. That's why, uh, uh in this case, it would be just, uh, 100% volunteering an ontological commitment to something that is not required. Yeah. That makes Can sense. I do it? Yes. <laughs> Anytime. Right. Do I have to do it? Is, imagine the following thing, like is it, the radio sends signals, sends music. I'm on here. I receive the music. I interpret the, the signals as music. I also want to believe that the signals represent the intrinsic nature of the radio. You are free to do that. Do they? I, it's unlikely. Okay. Mm -hmm. The radio sends signals. Um, now, some will say, no, 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 look, the radio is, seen, is sending a specific kind of signals. Signals about its own nature. Well, that's an interesting thought. So, maybe, but how do we know? Yeah. No. Right. And, and that is where my Kantian sort of uh, breaks start going like red. Do, 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 metaphysics. Do, 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 yeah. do, do, like, like, no, yeah. this is, and, and there's nothing wrong with metaphysics. It's like, um, uh, storytelling is anyone's game. Um, mm. enjoy, go, like, yeah. have fun. Like, but then I read Tolkien uh, and it's much better. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so final, final question for you. You've been so generous with your, with your time here. This is, this is for the audience. My, my audience loves simulation hypothesis. And I can see a, a connection here where someone might say, well, look, if we're okay, so we go in for, for transcendental idealism of a certain stripe and we're receiving these signals and, uh, we, we, we can't say what the thing in itself is. Does that mean that we're living, you know, in a simulation, even if we're, even even if not a uh, a computer simulation? You know, is it is the world that we see the Lebensvelt or the uh, the world for me, whatever terminology we use, ontology, the world of ontology, is that a, a simulated world, it's simulated by our own minds, maybe? Or that that's what gives a bad name to philosophy, unfortunately. These kind of uh, discussions. Um, and that's what gets philosophy departments closed down eh? because people think, oh, that's what you're doing. Okay. We don't need you. Uh, Interesting. Uh, but no, let me take it seriously for a moment. Okay. Um, it's like, uh, it's like saying, um, we live in a world full of, um, ghosts. Hmm. You can't. You can't touch them. You can't see them. In fact, you can't even prove that they are there, but they're there. Yes or no? Right. Mm. What kind of question is that? Mm. The 
premise undermines any possibility of providing a rational answer to the price. Hmm. Do we or do we not live in a simulation generated by the future? The premise undermines any possibility of a reasonable answer to the question. Hmm. So it's just, a, it's just a trick. It's one more trick that philosophers enjoy, but they should not play, or at least not publicly, because when society sees us wasting time after these silly things, hmm. then the judgment, no, we call for it, okay? Hmm. If that is what philosophy is, then people will ask, well, not with my taxpayer money. Uh, no, enjoy Saturday and Sunday, yeah. but we need something else. So let me, let me put it in a different way. Um, there are a lot of questions that we ask that um, I call them absolute questions that provide by being posed no constraint whatsoever in terms of what could be the space of a reasonable answer. Hmm. If you have removed by asking that question any chance of providing an answer that makes any sense, well, why are you asking the first question in the first place? So what, what is, so sometimes, and that's where we took the wrong step. Uh, and with all these sort of experiments, simulation, and uh, the apparently, there's a confusion at the source. Mm -hmm. And it's the malicious demon confusion from Descartes onwards, at least, but also you know, Plato, when he says the, the ring that makes you invisible. Yeah. So, just... so all, all these things, I mean, we're talking about Plato and Descartes. So were they just, ridiculous people, even played, even the, no, what they were doing were thought experiments as means to an end, right? They were not ends themselves. Sure. They were not asking, uh, is it possible no, to, uh, okay, uh, be con constantly you know, deceived by a demon? Do I live or do I not live in a world in which a demon is creating all this? No, matrix simulation is always the same story. No? I virtualize that. Dickard wasn't asking that stupid question because mm. he was a genius. He was asking, how can I possibly test at the very end of no, the road in the most dramatic sense, like road test this car? What mm. are the most extreme weather conditions for this car called human knowledge under which it will crack? And the most extremes are, imagine a demon. Can he even pass that test? He can, at least not Cathy, you know, Cogito, et cetera. Sure. Well, then I can drive that car even when a demon is around. I hope people are getting the analogy. Here. Yeah, it's a great analogy. But yeah. that was, you know, but it's like, I think it was an engineer. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget. Yeah. So when, when he says, look, uh, let, let me test this artifact that is human knowledge, putting so much pressure until he cracks, does he crack even when I go total blast? No, malicious demon. No, something remains. Hmm. They call you. Bingo. I can rebuild everything from there. Boom. Like that. Now, it's a class. We still read it because of that, but not because he was wondering, do I or do I not live in a world where I'm a little demon <laughs> makes me think that yeah. I'm in front of the fire like, seriously, <clears throat> that is totally useless because <clears throat> if that is not the, not the tool you're using to test the theory, but it's actually the end of the game, yeah. then you're playing the wrong game. Yeah. That game is a waste of time. <clears throat> and that's what we started with. That is not. A, phil a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. That is a philosopher's question. And no one cares at all about philosopher's questions. Mm -hmm. Everybody cares about philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. And the distinction, I hope, no, if you, there's one message for this, keep this in mind. Am I asking a philosophical question or am I asking philosopher's questions? Mm -hmm. Extended mind, virtual reality, simulation, <laughs> AI taking over the world, that will leave no trace and will be in the chapter of how philosophy can be so embarrassing. Mm. No, thank you. Okay. There yeah. is no book like that that I want to see back in the back there. <laughs> That's Have good. I been not, uh, abrasive enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Doc, Dr. Fleury, this, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, for all your time and, and letting me, you know, go through all these even philosopher questions. This has been great. Um, folks, that's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.